Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the final event in the Warfield Center's inaugural Black Religions and Spirituality Day, the theme of which has been Black Health and Wellness. I am Warfield Center Director Jennifer Wilkes, and it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Elise M. Edwards is an assistant professor of religion at Baylor University. She earned her PhD in religion at Claremont Graduate University in California, where she studied theology, ethics, and culture. Prior to pursuing a PhD in theology, Dr. Edwards worked as an architect in Washington, DC, and she still maintains her license to practice architecture. Her research is interdisciplinary, moving between fields of theology, ethics, architectural theory, and aesthetics to examine issues of civic engagement and to question how Christian beliefs and commitments are expressed publicly. As a Black feminist, Dr. Edwards focuses her research on cultural expressions by, for, and about women and marginalized communities. She is co-editor with Katie Day of the Rutledge Handbook of Religion and Cities and is currently working on another book, Building Justice, Theological Commitments in Architectural Design, which is about Christian liberationist values in architectural design. The title of her talk today is Creating Space to Heal and Flourish, Black Liberation as Inspiration for Design. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elise M. Edwards. Thank you so much. I am honored to be part of this inaugural Black Religions and Spirituality Day. It is days like this that I really do think I have my dream job. I get to learn from others as we explore and recognize and celebrate Black diasporic traditions and cultures. Uh, I get to witness Black brilliance and creativity at work. And I get to be a part of a whole collective of people who are committed to Black health and wellness. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for attending on a Friday afternoon um, and thank everyone working behind the scenes to make this event work. I'm especially grateful to the John L. Warfield Center for African and African-American Studies and UT's Department of Religious Studies for this event. Uh, as I was introduced, um, I usually like to state out front that I am a Christian ethicist and a Black feminist. Um, my scholarship to date, both what has been published and forthcoming, centers on theological ethical reflection on arts and cultural production broadly, but particularly architecture and the built environment. And all of that is significantly informed by my training as an architect before pursuing my academic vocation in theological ethics. In 2017, I published a paper that examined spiritual principles in contemporary African American social justice movements and considers the implications for those principles in creating spaces that promote the flourishing of Black lives. Um, and so in the chat, you might see the link to that, to that article. Uh, the research question behind that project was how might African-American spirituality guide us to create a built environment that affirms Black life? So this afternoon, I'll be drawing from some of the insights I developed in that paper, but also sharing some new insights. Obviously, our world has undergone radical shifts since 2017 in how we think about health. I think that also in the summer of 2020, we saw renewed commitments to addressing racial disparities and to recognizing the precarity of black life. After the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there were many people who were finally um, able to see the crisis of black death um, and were able to recognize just how vulnerable black life can be in a culture that devalues blackness. So our work today, all of the scholars and panelists and participates, participants uh, who participated in this event, our work of celebrating blackness is vitally important in this context. When I think about the theme of black health and wellness as a Christian ethicist and an architect, 
two questions come to mind and I'll start sharing my uh, screen now uh, so that you can see uh, some of the um, images that, um, that relate to this. Okay, uh, so two questions come to mind when I think of um, Black health and wellness as a Christian ethicist and an architect. Um, the first question is, how is Black health and wellness affected by the places where Black people reside? Uh, and by reside here, I don't just mean where they live, but where, um, where they're active, where they work, where they uh, play, where they rest. Uh, and the second question is, how can Black religions and spirituality support the creation and preservation of spaces where Black people flourish? So I'd like to briefly address the first question before spending more time discussing the second. So this first question of how is uh, Black health and wellness um, affected by the places where people reside? Uh, race is linked to several social determinants of health. Um, many of us are familiar with the concept of social determinants of health and how they are linked to zip codes, uh, but in case you aren't, uh, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, social determinants of health are the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. These social determinants can be grouped into five domains that include economic stability, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, which is the domain that I'll be talking about today, and social and community context. Aspects of life that promote good health. And so here you can think of education, meaningful connections, stability, these promote good health. They become much more difficult to procure or sustain in unsafe housing, in polluted environments, and in neighborhoods that lack access to affordable sources of nutritious foods and places for physical activity. Activists from the National Housing Institute caution us though, for about blaming places for problems that are actually the result of policy. So it's not the zip code you live in that's the problem. It, it's the policy about the zip codes. Uh, they say that the conditions of life in neighborhoods, their physical boundaries, accessibility, residents, businesses, infrastructure, services, amenities, even air quality, reflect legacies of racially motivated discrimination that systematically and unjustly disadvantage some people and places while advantaging others. Just like blaming people for unhealthy choices or behaviors overlooks root causes of poor health and the limited choices some people have, blaming places for being under-resourced fails to account for legacies of discrimination, underinvestment, and other root causes of marginalization and exclusion. The point I want to make here is that neighborhoods and the buildings within them are shaped by policies, practices, and patterns that are not race neutral. On the contrary, where we live, who we live near, and what kinds of facilities and infrastructure there is around us is very much influenced by race and a legacy of racist economic and development policies in the U.S. So where we live and work and move is always, con always creating conditions for how we live. Wellness for Black people is, has to be thought of in this broad sense. And wellness is not just about promoting physical health um, because survival is not enough. Flourishing, true flourishing has to be our goal. And to flourish, we need spaces of beauty. We need places of leisure and rest. And we need neighborhoods where Black vitality is visible, where Black history is commemorated, and where the potential of our future is celebrated. In other words, we need spaces where Black people can live freely and see Black flourishing out in the open. 
So I have a few slides here uh, that show uh, some of the uh, kinds of places where we might see black vitality and black uh, flourishing out in the open. Uh, playgrounds, certainly uh, places of worship. This is a historic image, of course, but you can see the background of the mill town. This is uh, taken in uh, Pittsburgh, this image. Um, but you see the people themselves um, are, are sort of in contrast to, to that, that mill gritty background. Uh, and, and here's a picture of um, Waco, our East Waco area, where you see a community mural uh, that was developed and painted by uh, high school students in our community uh, under the leadership of artists, uh, which really depicts Black flourishing in the East Waco neighborhood uh, over the course of a week. So the beginning of the week is on the left side of the image, uh, and then it goes throughout the various activities and events that would happen. Uh, during the week. I'll include a link to uh, a description of this mural later on uh, in the presentation. But all of these are, are about celebrating Black flourishing and creating spaces where Black vitality becomes visible. So I want to move to the second question, which is how can Black religions and spirituality support the creation and preservation of spaces where Black people flourish? Um, it should come as no surprise as a theologian and ethicist that I believe Christian theology can offer a meaningful way of questioning and constructing moral values with the spiritual grounding that can actually transform human thought and action. It goes without saying that this work can be done in any religious tradition that, that promotes wellness and engagement with the world around us. Uh, this doesn't need to be the work of organized religions either, but can be part of spiritual communities or activist communities who draw on eclectic spiritual practices. Black Lives Matter activists have long been, have, have been known to burn sage at sites of conflict, which is a ritualized cleansing practice that invites balance, love, and light. They have also constructed altars to honor the dead at protest sites. And activists read the names of the dead as a sacred act of remembrance. In addition to these spiritual practices, organizations within the Movement for Black Lives host events focused on emotional health and spiritual well being. Participants in these spiritual practices know that social transformation involves politics and policy, but they believe that the transformative work is. All, they believe that transformative work is ultimately a spiritual effort that requires a shift in consciousness. Although Black Lives Matter is predominantly a political and ideological movement, its co-founder Patrice Cullors believes that political engagement alone will not accomplish the transformative work that needs to happen. In the On Being podcast, uh, and there's a link uh, to this, which we can drop in the chat too. Uh, in the On Being, on being podcast, uh, Colors insisted, uh, I think that this work of Black Lives Matter is actually healing work, she says. It's not just about policy. It's why I think some people get so confused by us. They're like, where's the policy? I'm like, you can't policy your racism away. We no longer have Jim Crow laws, but we have Jim Crow hate. So she's not disregarding the importance of policy, but she's asserting rather strongly that human transformation is dependent on inner change. This is the type of reorientation that religionists call conversion. Although spiritual transformation does not necessarily require the aid of formalized religious communities, African-American communities have perennially drawn from black religion to propel and sustain transformative justice movements and cultivate resistance to racism and other death dealing forces. So in the rest of my time, I'd like to discuss what it might mean to draw inspiration from black, from black Christian theology to literally reconstruct our world through architecture in more just ways. Liberation in particular is a moral commitment to justice informed by Christian theological norms and sources, and it can inspire design. 
Now, obviously, Christianity is not a Black religion, and the ways it is practiced by Black communities is not always just or freeing for everyone who identifies as Black. But the idea of liberation in Black liberation theologies is robust enough to inspire us to write action, which is why I use it as my starting point. So there are many different types of liberation theologies. Uh, liberation theologies center on the experiences of marginalized people and their contributions to theology. It shifts the discourse from talking about marginalized people or at marginalized people to promoting them as the center of discourse. What do oppressed people say about their own experience and what can dominant groups and their theologies learn from them? Liberation theology, as the name suggests, also has its aims of liberating the world from sin, particularly social and systemic forms of sin like racism. The central idea is that God wants the flourishing and well-being of all creation to take root, and that this is a crucial part of what salvation in Christ means, that Jesus came to liberate all from sin which means transforming sins that are perpetrated by us, but also transforming the sins that are perpetrated upon us. Liberation is about living into an ideal of the kingdom of God and expressing the prophetic views of the church. And I just wanna add a side note about language. I say kingdom of God, uh, inspired by feminist theologians to move away from language about monarchies, to describe what is ultimately a communal collective consciousness, uh, but this is what others would call the kingdom of God. Uh, another feature of liberation theologies is that they affirm the dignity of the human being and that that dignity of the human being is never based on an individualistic sense of personhood, but an understanding of human existence within an interdependent web of relationships with others within and beyond our particular communities. I believe liberation can be a powerful norm to motivate social action, communal wellness, art making, and all kinds of embodied practices that demonstrate care for Black people. I've really enjoyed um, the, the discussions today uh, that, that I've been able to witness uh, from the panel this morning uh, to, to the presentation on red lip theology to the creatio divina exercise. Um, these all can, can be a way of eliciting care for Black people. Um, and, and liberation can be a powerful norm behind that. When I say norm, I'm speaking as an ethicist where norm refers to the guiding principles and ideals that guide us on how to live well. In the social teaching of the Black churches, Ethicist Peter Paris talks about the Black normative tradition that pervades diverse expressions of Black religion and unites Black denominations and churches who have distinctive doctrines and polity. He writes, the tradition that has always been normative for the Black churches and the Black community is not the so-called Western Christian tradition per se, although this tradition is an important resource for Blacks. More accurately, the normative tradition for Blacks is that tradition governed by the principle of non-racism, which we call the Black Christian tradition. The fundamental principle of the Black Christian tradition is depicted most adequately in the biblical doctrine of the parenthood of God and the kinship of all peoples. So let's talk about how this principle of liberation can inspire architecture for healing and flourishing. Racism is expressed in architecture and through architectural practice in many ways. Um, it's beyond the scope of my lecture or time here to um, go into detail about all the ways, uh, but I'll discuss and introduce three domains of racism in architecture and um, begin to talk about uh, what liberation can inspire as a transformative response to each. So the three are listed on the screen. Uh, the, we have racism in architecture, in the practice of architecture, in uh, spatial racism, and in aesthetics of architecture that promote whiteness and devalue blackness. 
So let me start with talking about the practice of architecture which is uh, architecture as a uh, profession and the discipline of training that goes into that. Uh, architecture is not a di diverse profession and it's a profession that tends to serve elite interests. When I got my architecture license, uh, African-American women made up 0.2% of registered architects. So that's less than 1%, 0.2% of registered architects. So that means that in a room of 100 architects, not even one of them would be a, a black woman, unless I happen to be there. <laughs> um, when I last checked that number, it was still less than 1%. So it was increasing, but only increasing by percentages of a percent. The diversity of the profession is increasing uh, as, our, as accredited architecture programs at universities are diversifying their student bodies and also diversifying their faculties. Uh, but I have to note that for decades before DEI became uh, a buzzword in higher education, uh, seven HBCUs have been primarily responsible for most of the racial, racial diversity that presently exists in the field. Um, by matriculating Black students and employing Black faculty. Uh, so I grad graduated from a, an architecture program at an HBCU at Florida A&M. But like many professions that have a multi-step path to licensure and certification, the further along you go in your career, the less, the less diverse the profession becomes. So the graph you see to the right of the screen um, shows data from 2018 on racial diversity. And while the numbers aren't really very easy to read, um, what I wanna convey is the graphic impact of the image itself. So if you start at the left of the chart, that represents uh, new record holders. So that's the very beginning of someone's um, career into architecture, uh, where they uh, register with NCARB, um, which is the National uh, Accrediting Board for, for Architecture and Architecture Schools. Uh, after you start a record, uh, you start participating in a uh, apprenticeship type, type program, getting experience in the field called AXP. Uh, after that, you begin taking your licensing exams um, and then hopefully you complete your licensing exams, uh, then you can get your architecture license. Uh, after licensure, you can get a certificate that allows you to um, uh, practice architecture in other states. Um, so you're licensed in one particular state, but a certificate can help you move that around. Um, so these are multiple steps that you might undergo, undergo in your career. So if you look at the first slide in 2018, new record um, holders uh, was still predominantly white, but it looks kind of balanced between non-white, um, white, Hispanic or Latino, uh, which was broken apart as a category and white, non-Hispanic or Latino. But as you move through each of those steps that get you closer to licensure, or certification, uh, the percentage of non-white and of Latino uh, registrants drops significantly. So that by the time you're looking at certificate holders, which are the people with the most expertise and um, credentials in the field, uh, you're looking at uh, a group that's 90% white. Uh, so. Let me take just a moment, let's see where we are on time. Let me take just a moment to show a video that shows the numbers for today. Uh, so let me uh, adjust something here on the screen. Thank you. 
So we can uh, put in the chat uh, some of the um, uh, the link to the NCARB website that has the data from 2021, which is the most recent year that data uh, is collected. We're in 2022 now, so they have data from last year. Um, and uh, you can explore the numbers in much more depth. Um, but let me say that if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, Craig Wilkins has a chapter on racism in architecture as a discipline in his book, uh, The Aesthetics of Equity, Notes on Race, Space, Architecture, and Music. And I think I have a link for that too. Um, if we're inspired by the norm of liberation to address the practice of architecture, uh, we have to uh, transform the education system. And that starts in early childhood to show representation of Black architects and to encourage Black children to pursue STEM careers and artistic and creative careers. Um, we, we tend to put architecture in with STEM disciplines, um, but the curriculum in most architecture programs uh, values, nurtures, and rewards students on their creativity and innovation more than something like their math skills or understanding of physics principles. Um, so our communities need to be fostering creative expression if we're going to um, see a change in, uh, in architecture. And obviously, uh, fostering creative expression is important, not just for future careers, but uh, art has its own value uh, for self-expression and community transformation. Uh, a commitment to liberation would also require us to diversify the faculties at architecture schools uh, to integrate, integrate social analysis into the curriculum um, and to be able to uh, address how designers might understand how racism gets built into architecture, uh, which is what I want to uh, discuss next. Uh, so there are various forms of spatial racism that operate at the city level, at the neighborhood level, and also at the building level. Uh, writing about racism in Chicago, Francis uh, Cardinal George explains what spatial racism is. Spatial racism refers to patterns of metropolitan development in which some affluent whites create racially and economically segregated, segregated suburbs or gentrified areas of cities leaving poor, mainly African-Americans, Hispanics, and some newly arrived immigrants isolated in deteriorating areas of the cities and older suburbs. He's describing spatial racism at the regional or city level, but it can be practiced within buildings too. The root issue that characterizes spatial racism is a racially based determination of who belongs where and what kind of resources they deserve space itself becomes inscribed with a racial hierarchy. And many people of color have, have felt this. Um, you've entered rooms or buildings where you've immediately felt that you are not welcome there, or perhaps not. it's not that you aren't welcome, but you're simply not expected to be there. That's the kind of racial hierarchy that gets mapped onto spaces. And this spatial racism can have deadly effects, like when we, we look at the, the life and death of Trayvon Martin. And it can have serious consequences when police are called to remove Black people from spaces that they have a legitimate right to be in. So what does that have to do with architecture? You know, I can imagine people thinking, okay, yeah, that's a problem we know about, right? The kind of racism that identifies black people as dangerous when they're just walking down the street or when they're drinking coffee or when they're sleeping or grilling in a park. And, and that's a social problem. But how do we blame buildings for that? I'm arguing that we need to remember that the design of architecture is a social process. It's not a natural process. Buildings don't make themselves or grow out of the ground. They are created by architects and other designers who help their clients figure out what kinds of spaces they need and who those spaces are for. That's the first step in design. Designers then make numerous decisions based on spatial hierarchies. So they distinguish between public and private, 
between who or what gets seen and what gets hidden. Uh, even when we think of something, the concept of like a front door and a back door, um, what are we saying about what get what's visible and who uses which door? Um, spatial hierarchies can be mapped onto what kind of functions uh, in a building deserve privacy or who gets the views or more square footage. And privacy views and square footage are all ways of communicating prestige or power in architecture. Architectural design is a social process that transforms ideas into forms and creates places for particular ways of being and inhabiting the world. So what does liberation look like then? It means that we are reclaiming and making black space. And by black space, I mean that we need literal spaces where black people can be free for our health and flourishing. So a few examples of what that might look like uh, of reclaiming and making black space uh, inspired by liberation. Uh, first, we can en engage in religious or spiritual practices that honor ancestral lands and connect us to an ethic of care for the lands we reside. Um, we should acknowledge that there have been many forced traumatic migrations uh, across the Atlantic, um, but even the Great Migration was uh, in many ways motivated by racial terror. Um, so how do we reconnect to our ancestral lands? Um, those of us who move away from our families, how can we honor land um, and also care for where we reside? Uh, land acknowledgements are a way of reclaiming space or um, making space acknowledge um, uh, inspired by liberation. Uh, I'm speaking from my office at, at Baylor University and the land that this university on is on uh, was occupied by the Waco people, the Tonkwa people, uh, and the Kickapoo people, uh, indigenous peoples who had this land long before colonizers came in. Uh, community organizing uh, is also a way of making and claiming Black space, uh, especially when we are organizing around issues of city planning, housing, homelessness, infrastructure, or labor practices. Uh, so I talked about uh, the discipline of architecture having racism uh, embedded into it. Uh, construction certainly does uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, after community organizing, we can think about designing spaces for uses by Black people and celebration of Black culture. Uh, I have the image there of Black Lives Matter being painted on the street, right? That's celebrating Black culture in in space, taking a street and literally making it black space. Uh, a fifth way that we can uh, be inspired by liberation is encouraging and promoting the agency and voice of diverse perspectives in design, in community planning and in political decision-making. So I, I talked about how architecture is, uh, is tied to uh, servicing the elites uh, and how we can't rely, or I hope you understood that if the profession is not diverse, we cannot rely on the professionals alone. That is those with the expertise in design to be the only ones who are designing. Uh, our practices of design uh, need to be more participatory and based in community design so that we don't have just uh, educated architects designing, but we have interaction between the architects and community members who have a different kind of knowledge and experiential expertise that can inform the design. And I can say so much more about that. Um, so feel free to ask. Dr. Edwards, you are muted. There we go. Uh, number six on the screen, uh, it mentions uh, designing for the common good. Uh, so this is about creating spaces that are for the commons, for multiple people, for the whole community, and valuing beauty, safety, participation, and sustainability. 
um, beauty, safety for those who typically feel unsafe. Uh, and here I'm not talking about white people who are threatened by the uh, presence of black people, but black people who feel unsafe because of their hyper visibility, uh, creating spaces that meet the needs of those who are who are unsafe. Uh, we can also and should also design rooms and buildings and spaces that allow moments of separatism or individual retreat for health. Uh, so I'm not saying every building needs its like black room, right, where uh, black people, uh, only black people can go to retreat. Um, but I am saying there's a design problem if we only have common spaces that don't allow people to separate. Uh, and I'm thinking of cafeterias, right, in a predominantly white space where you have a large cafeteria or dining space where you have a group of, let's say, students who are gathered uh, to eat. And this group of uh, five black students eating together suddenly becomes hyper visible in, uh, in this space. Uh, if there is design that allows them to choose to go someplace else where they can also enjoy their lunch in peace and have a safe space for conversation, uh, that would be a better uh, design that literally makes space for them. And then much of what I've been saying for the past few minutes relates to challenging um, the way public space is currently conceived uh, and the way that many are, are um, so-called public spaces are really privatized spaces. So here think of uh, shopping malls and other types of uh, commercial spaces that are uh, thought of as public, but that are really um, part of uh, a capitalistic system. So the last point I wanna to get to about um, architecture and racism has to do with the aesthetics of architecture and uh, particularly aesthetics that promote whiteness and devalue blackness. Uh, phys physical and cultural landscapes that affirm whiteness are all around us, very often in the architecture that is supposed to symbolically represent the nation and the state. So on screen, I have images of the US Capitol building. Uh, the US Capitol and many other government buildings built in the 1800s were modeled off of Greek and Roman temples and monumental architecture. Uh, drawing upon these ancient traditions was a way to signify the ideals of the new nation. So ancient Greece was perceived as the birthplace of democracy. And so it was thought that it would be fitting that these, this architecture of the new United States uh, would mimic that, um, that call to democracy. Only the designers of this new nation thought that our democracy was an improvement on the older models of democracy. So in that vein, the architecture too incorporated some of the uniquely American history of democracy. Uh, in the Capitol building, George Washington sits in the place of God in artwork on the interior of the Capitol's dome. I can't make this up, right? <laughs> Instead of God, you have George Washington. Um, and to the right of this screen, uh, you see uh, columns in the hall of columns. Uh, traditionally in, uh, in uh, ancient architecture, the top or capital of a Corinthian column would be uh, represented with acanthus leaves. In this building, you have the top of this column um, decorated with tobacco and cotton leaves. Um, so the, the columns themselves reference our agriculture and economic system, which of course was slavery. The building itself was constructed with enslaved labor. And of course, at a very obvious level, the building is white which becomes an aesthetic language used for most of the federal buildings in DC and in many state legislatures around the country, even in locations where white stone was not easy to obtain as a building material. So we can contrast that with um, other works of architecture like uh, just down the street from the Capitol, the uh, National Museum of African-American History and Culture uh, like other high profile museums, this building was, uh, the design of this building was selected through a competition 
The winning entry was submitted by a team led by David Ajay, a London-based Ghanaian British architect, by Philip Freelon, the head of the largest minority-owned architecture firm in the United States, and J. Max Bond, Jr., who was known as the Dean of African American Architects. Ajay, the lead designer, envisioned a bronze panel building that draws on the shape of a Yoruban karyatid, which is a traditional column topped by a corona or a crown. And yet the architecture also references a narrative of African diaspora and enslavement. The decorative patterned exterior panels reference a tradition of metal smithing developed by freed slaves. I know one of our earlier panelists uh, talked about metal slip smith smithing uh, in her family, right? And so it's that tradition that, that he's calling upon here. Um, he's explaining, he explains that the building's form tells a story that moves from one continent where people were taken along with their cultures and used as labor and then contributed toward making another co country and new cultures. The interior too communicates a narrative it's a passage through history that includes the horrors, celebratory moments. Uh, it talks about cultural achievements and there are spaces for contemplation and rest. Um, so there's an article about the contemplative court, uh, which is pictured to the right of the uh, slide there um, that we can drop into the chat as well. Uh, so here you just see more pictures of the panels. Uh, and the picture on the right is looking from the inside of the museum out the windows where you see that panel. Uh, the architect really intended for the experience of the museum to differ from other Smithsonian buildings. Uh, so the exhibit spaces are typically closed off to the outside world in other Smithsonian museums. But Ajay explained that the other museums function a bit like cinema, right? You go into a different world and then you come back out. Uh, and he didn't want that. He says, the experience of being black is not a fiction. There's something important about always coming back to the light of day. So I, I say this to show you images of what an aesthetics that honor blackness might look like. Uh, we see this not just in this one museum, but in uh, memorials, uh, in murals, in other forms of public art. We can see this in community gardens as uh, a new aesthetic that celebrates and honors blackness. Uh, here's an image of George Floyd Square. The idea is that we need architectural elements that reference diverse cultures uh, and have an actual aesthetic that shows um, a different value from whiteness. Um, so I'll end with this image. These are two images from Waco. Um, they are community art projects. Um, so the other images tended to be brown. You don't have to use brown uh, materials to honor blackness in architecture. Uh, the top image here is on a public health building um, that celebrates the legacies of um, women who, um, who were serving the community uh, as community health uh, activists before um, or at a time when physicians weren't. Um, which I think we heard about earlier, uh, the importance of that in uh, the first panel today. Uh, and then the second one really celebrates um, a lot of iconography. You can see masks and their whales, uh, other symbols um, that have all sorts of spiritual meaning, um, like the, the presentation that just preceded this. Uh, so here we have those same ideas, but made the size of a building. So I'll end there um, so that we have uh, some time to, um, to uh, answer questions. And I really look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Edwards. Um, so uh, we have a question in the Q&A, which I'll read shortly, but I just wanna echo um, Kendall's encouragement to um, drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, so the first question comes, um, from an anonymous guest um, who writes, I received each of my degrees from a predominantly white institution, Baylor. Regarding spatial racism, what, you, what would you recommend we do to navigate white spaces or where we are not expected in a way that we nourish our dignity 
where we may not hold the power to influence those spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think this, uh, I think this goes back to um, the idea that one, the space itself can't only do the work, uh, that you have to have a community who creates the practices of engaging with that space. Um, so the first way to navigate predominantly white environments, and, and I, you know, I'm at Baylor now, <laughs> navigating a predominantly white environment, um, and is, is that you have to find community, right? So you have to have people who, um, who, who make that space smaller, right? Especially when you're talking about a large university or even the buildings, right? A large academic buildings, you have to find people who um, can gather with you um, and, and, uh, and give you a sense of home or a sense of being at home in a strange land, right? Uh, and this is one thing that um, Black spirituality has done, uh, has, has sustained us in the Americas for generations by creating that sense of space through our gatherings, right? Um, and then there may be occasions to carve out, there may be opportunities to carve out physical spaces. So um, on Baylor's campus, for instance, uh, there was no um, uh, visible uh, reminder or, or recognition of um, African-American student organizations, right? Uh, specifically fraternities and sororities. So we have to push to advocate for a new community garden that highlights black fraternities and sororities. Um, in our library, the librarians have made efforts now to put huge banners and signs when you walk in showing the diversity of the student body and the diversity of the work and scholarship represented within that library. Um, to announce publicly that this is not a white space, even though it may be filled with predominantly white students. Um, so I think we have to push uh, by, have, by creating spaces that are at the very least welcoming in diversity. But the step beyond that would be uh, to create spaces that allow individuals and particular groups to, um, to be uh, separate for, for some time. Thank you. I love the way that your response resonates with our, well, with your distinction between kingdom and kingdom, right? So collectivity, community, and then also an earlier discussion of um, villages, like where's yeah. your village? Find yes. your people. Yes. Um, and then when you found your people, you have the collective power to then say, we need space, right? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and this is, you know, what sit-ins did and protests. And these are old strategies that, that are still relevant. Thank you. So our next question comes from Jade, who asks, often separatism is wrongly understood or perceived as segregation. Can you talk about what advocating and petitioning for separatism or separate spaces for Black people can look like in predominantly white spaces? Yeah, and I think I, I mentioned a little bit of that in my last response, but the key difference between segregation and uh, separation uh, or separatism is that segregation is something that is imposed on you uh, by others. There's a okay. social system that has a hierarchical construction of who matters more and therefore who deserves more and who matters least and who deserves least. So practices of segregation in uh, the built environment uh, include redlining, which we, we all know about as literally marking off zones saying, this is where the black and brown people are. This is an undesirable, dangerous, unsafe area. Um, practices of disinvestment, um, practices of predatory inclusion as Kianga Yamada Taylor refers mm. to it, uh, that where the lending practices, once they stopped redlining, they're like, okay, well now we'll give you predatory loans to be able to develop these spaces, right? All of these practices continue to separate people, not by their own choice, but by the lack of opportunity and resources mm. to make changes. That to me is different from something like establishing an African-American church or religious community, where you are saying, it's not only because we cannot do better <laughs> or we cannot do something else that we gather, mm -hmm but it's because we see the value of being together for our own sustenance. And I think in 
you know, in the 21st century, we're not talking about separatism, or at least I'm not advocating a separatism that is in place for all time, but rather for moments, for, mm -hmm. um, for times of, um, as Alice Taylor would say in her description of womanist, right, that there's this, um, this need, you're not a separatist, but you will be a separatist for, for matters of health, right? That sometimes you really do need to get away from those crazy people, right? Uh, and so that you can have the energy and the resources and the right spirit to uh, join them. So I think separatism allows um, Black people to tap into uh, the traditions that are most nurturing and um, to hear uh, spirit in a way that they can't when they are with others. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Donatus who asked, historically, housing or racial covenants were a method in which Blacks were kept out of neighborhoods they could afford to live in. So this dovetails nicely with what you were just saying. Racism via architecture is different from racism via manipulation of policy. However, how do we go about reclaiming spaces, both existing and yet to exist, while mitigating the mindsets that segregated them to begin with? Yeah, I mean, that's basically the whole thing I'm talking about, right? We have to first realize that our spaces are a reflection of our stratifications in society. And that that's at the city level, most of us are aware of that now um, with the histories of redlining and the persistence of segregated cities. So census data continues to show that most of us live um, in neighborhoods that are predominantly of our own race, right? Uh, that has not changed throughout um, American history. That's still the case um, in most major cities. Uh, you can Google racial dot map, uh, which will pull up the data from uh, not the most recent census, the one before that, where visually you can see a representation of what your own zip code and city looks like uh, and who your neighbors are represented by race and it's it's eye-opening. Um, so I forgot the second part of the question. Uh, <laughs> sure, let me, um, so the second part is, um, how do we go about reclaiming spaces, both existing and yet to exist, while mitigating the mindsets that segregated them to begin with? Yeah, so the work that we've all been talking about doing here in spiritual communities, in, um, in our schools and universities of uh, continuing to talk about racism and talk about the various ways that racism manifests uh, is part of that, that deconstructive work. But we also have to start um, emphasizing the power of creativity and innovation more. Um, while I think, um, you know, many Black children today might be encouraged to go into STEM fields by their families, not their schools, not their career counselors, but most people's families would not have a problem with someone becoming a doctor or an engineer. Um, and yet, if that person says, I want to be a musician or I want to be a painter, um, there's a, a high level of fear um, associated with that. Um, so I think we have to begin to start cultivating the importance of creativity, um, not just for professionals and, and careers, but for our own um, well-being, and look to the power of art to transform uh, art and architecture. So funding projects like the community murals I was talking about, <coughs> painting the streets, taking over plazas and making them George Floyd Square. We can do that without an initiating trauma or tragic event. We can do that as celebration, not just commemoration. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I think this will be our, our last question. And again, this extends wonderfully from what you were just saying. So you've given us the examples of um, the murals in Waco, um, but Kendall asked, um, perhaps for additional examples. So have you encountered any particular community groups that have inspired you with their reimagination or reclamation of black spaces? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's mostly cultural centers, right? So um, mostly black cultural centers do this. 
uh, and also storefront churches. Uh, storefront church is sort of a derogatory term in, um, in the sociology, but uh, the idea of taking spaces that were built for some other purpose and transforming them is done in all kinds of ways. I mean, I, I can even give a small example. I'm, I'm in my office right now. This was not a black space by any means of the imagination. And yet I made it into one by putting up black art all around it, uh, behind the computer. I have fabric from Cameroon that a friend brought me celebrating uh, International Women's Day from 2017. Uh, I look upon this fabric, I am sustained, I'm reminded what my scholarship is for, the values it connects me to, the community it connects me to, not just uh, as African diasporic people, but my colleague, my friend who gave me this fabric while she was doing research abroad, right, thought of me and said, hey, let me bring this. So there are all sorts of ways that people transform individual spaces that they have. But uh, if we look at uh, storefront churches, at Black community centers, at community gardens, uh, these are the most um, clear examples, I think, of where we see people transforming uh, and, and making Black space. Thank you. Um, so on that note of transformation and of community. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking Dr. Edwards um, for sharing her work uh, with us and for generating such a rich um, conversation and continuing in the spirit of uh, affirmation and community. I'd also like to thank Black Religions and Spirituality Day curator, Jade Evans, Warfield Center Senior Program Coordinator, Christina Bryant, Dr. Jennifer Graber in the Department of Religious Studies, Warfield Graduate Assistant Alex Cunningham, and last but definitely not least, Art Galleries at Black Studies, Curator of Public Programs, Kendall Gross. This event could not have happened without their ideas, their labor, and their support. So let's give them a virtual round of applause. Um, Thank you again for coming to our first Black Religions and Spirituality Day. Please take care. And to paraphrase Dr. Edwards, may you find the resources you need to rest, to flourish, and to live freely. Take care, everyone.